the News Agents USA. I know this is a news podcast, but I have to give this warning. There will be content of a sexual nature from the very start. How was sex and relationships described to you growing up? I wasn't really allowed to even acknowledge the opposite sex. I didn't even know how to use a tampon. I was like, do I have eight holes? What are some red flags that you now know? (laughs) I would never put up with that now. Someone that won't just help. It's like, if I come downstairs and the kitchen is clean and you've done it all and you've done all the dishes and you've closed all the pantry doors, you better be ready to get your dick socked. I mean, like, literally. (laughs) That was Katy Perry on the podcast Call Her Daddy. It was an episode that she did, which was titled Narcissists, Blowjobs and Red Flags. And as you can hear, it is quite a zeitgeisty, quite a poppy sort of flavour. It is, I think, the most listened to podcast by young women in the world. It's hosted a huge array of uh, celebs from Miley Cyrus to Gwyneth Paltrow to Priyanka Chopra. It's a magnet for the Gen Z woman. And its latest guest, Kamala Harris. (laughs) Although I think fair to say that she doesn't discuss some of those topics about blowjobs and dicks. Well, we don't want to spoil it, do we? (laughs) But this is a way of framing what she is doing now. 27 days left. But is this really the best strategy she's got. Welcome to the News Agents USA. It's John. It's Emily. And Kamala Harris has been busy. Of course she's been busy, as you say, 27 days to the election. But for someone who has not made many media appearances, she certainly changed that in the past few days with a whole number. And I think the question you framed at the start is the key question. Like, kind of we know she's got Gen Z women. We know she's got college educated women. We know that young people, thanks to Taylor Swift and Billie Eilish, are rallying to her side. Is she doing enough to reach out to demographics where she's not doing so well that formed part of the Biden coalition back in 2020? It's a really different flavour, isn't it, to past elections? Because we are so used to using those slightly cliched, you know, crisscrossing the countries, doing her rallies. And yes, she is doing rallies and she is doing in-person appearances. But look, Call Her Daddy gets five million listeners a week, right? I mean, it is, I think, the most listened to podcast amongst the sort of Gen Z women. So she knows exactly who she's going to and she's getting the people that, as you say, are probably already on side, unless they're on side but not registered, in which case she thinks, I've got to get you off your sofa. You might like me. But are you actually going to get off your sofa? So she's trying to reach them. And the kind of stuff she's talking about is, you know, women's autonomy, men's bodily autonomy. Let's just play you a little clip of what happened when she sat down with the host. I want to pose this question more to you and the daddy gang. But Mm -hmm. one of the biggest conversations in this year's election revolves around a woman's body. Mm -hmm. Yep. I want to take a moment. Mm -hmm. And can we try... Mm -hmm to think of any law that gives the government the power to make a decision. I know what you're going to (laughs) ask. About a man's body. No. No. Is there any law? So not a hard, I mean, not a hardball. Let's be honest. She's gone somewhere where she knows that all the questions will be aimed at helping her get these women to vote for her. It is, I think, left-leaning, you know, young-leaning, Democrat-leaning, whatever you want to call it. So she's almost been prompted the lines that help her, you know, get off to the right start with this. And the question is, does she feel, does she sound comfortable enough in that environment to kind of say, yeah, this is, you know, this will convince you to, to get out. And this is the critique of what she's doing. Yeah, great that you're doing media appearances, but you're not putting your head into the mouth of the lion and seeing how you fare. You are doing stuff that is maybe a touch more softball, a touch easier. I suppose the one where she has appeared is 60 Minutes, which I think is interesting. And Donald Trump has refused to appear 
on 60 Minutes, which has brought a giant harumph from 60 Minutes, which is an incredibly self-important programme. It's a very good programme on CBS, uh, but it is, takes itself incredibly seriously. It does, but I think what Bill Whitaker, who's the host of 60 Minutes, did was what we always talk about and which you rarely see in American interviews, which is the follow-up question. So Kamala Harris has had quite a few easy encounters, I think it's fair to say. And each time she sort of asked, you know, why did you change her mind? And I think she said in the, in the CNN interview, well, my values haven't changed. There was no follow-up to that. And what Bill Whitaker did, I think, on the 60 Minutes one was, you're trying to take the conversation over here. Let's just bring it back to the question I've asked. Let's just bring you back. I think he was much better at it. But the line that everyone is talking about is actually not her response to kind of ideological changes, but when he asks her flat out about her gun ownership. You recently surprised people when you said that you are a gun owner. And then if someone came into your that house... That's not the first time I've, I've, they I've would talked get shot. about it. That's not the first time I've talked about so it. So what kind of gun do you own and when and why did you get it? I have a Glock and um, I've had it for quite some time. And um, I mean, look, Bill, my background is in law enforcement. And um, so there you go. Have you uh, ever fired it? Yes. <laughs> of course I have. <laughs> At a shooting range. Yes, of course I have. What I like about that answer, funny enough, is that she doesn't over-talk it. You know, if you were perfecting this idea of being a gun owner because you thought it was really helpful, then you would probably talk more about it. You go, yes, well, I bought my pistol and, and I've done this. and I blah, blah, blah. But actually, when he says, have you, have you ever shot it? She sort of laughs because it's, it's the most obvious thing that you would have done if you owned a gun, if you, you know, wanted to make sure you could use it, right? But you look at previous attempts by candidates to connect with middle America and, you know, that sense of gun ownership. I mean, just it's kind of worth underscoring, isn't it? That can you imagine any British politician saying, yeah, I've got a Glock. Yeah, I've, yeah, of course I've shot it. You know, it, it just couldn't happen. I mean, so well, it literally couldn't happen. Literally couldn't happen because of the law. But it, it shows just how different. You know, you have to own a gun to be a proper. I mean, American you've actually candidate. raised a really interesting point, which is: could a British prime minister admit to going on what we might call a straightforward shooting weekend? <laughs> right? You know, a, could, could they admit to having a gun in the house? Probably not. I mean, David Cameron. You know, almost, almost certainly has. shoots and has a gun. You yeah. know, in in a, a house. I don't know about Boris Johnson. Um, Rishi Sunak, not. I don't think so. No, but I'm sure up until the sort of 1970s. Yes, it was normal. Yeah, they all, it was normal to yeah. go out on a pheasant shoot. I think that what's interesting about it is if you look at John Kerry back in 2004, he wanted to show that he was a hunter, and he turns out in this, you know, camouflage suit which looks like it has just come out of the shop's wrapper and has never been worn before. You think, no, trying too hard, and immediately it looks phony. And Mitt Romney, again, in 12, started talking about how he loves hunting, and it just came over as slightly inauthentic. I thought what Harris did there just sounded, yeah, it's no biggie. I've got a Glock, shot it. Yeah, I've been down the range. Yeah, of course. And, and I thought she handled it pretty well, and I think that will win her some support with the male brigade of people. The people that aren't listening to call her daddy. Exactly. (laughs) That might just think, you know what? Or maybe that's completely sexist. Maybe young women really are quite in favour of her owning a gun. God, I don't know. I went to uh, a gun show uh, just outside uh, Washington and filmed there when I was out there. And there was this woman who had a sort of twin set and pearls look. It looked like she would be more at home in the WI and uh, I said, oh, can I just ask what you come shopping for? She said, yeah, I'm looking for a laser sight uh, for, for the gun, you know, so that <laughs> I can, if any gun comes near my children, I can shoot them. Yes. Uh, yeah, well, of course you are, love. You know? That's why when she says I'm in law enforcement, you're like, oh, OK, you're serious about that gun. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, so it's, it is very, very normal for women to own guns. But I think that, you know, that Kamala Harris's play in talking up the fact that she's a regular gun owner and doesn't make, you know, it's not a big deal is to go for the male vote where there is much more suspicion of her, there is much more suspicion of women and where we know that America is more prone to misogyny than other countries. So the point about the 60 Minutes interview was not just that she did it, but that he would not, something that CBS made 
a lot of. And just to put this in the context of where we are, CNN has just issued an ultimatum to Donald Trump for a final debate, which they want to hold on October the 23rd. And they've said there's a cutoff date. And if you won't agree to it by, I think it's, you know, the end of this week, then it's not going to happen. They believe that Trump will still come to the wicket for one more debate because they think that he's not quite comfortable enough with the numbers to just let it go. And it will have annoyed him that Vance actually did, as we discussed last week, pretty well in that debate. There's nothing worse than your surrogate, Doing your deputy, better than you. outshining you. So I think that there is an open door for Trump still to say, yes, I will come back to the wicket. I will do this last debate with Kamala Harris, which would be in a couple of weeks time. But meanwhile, he's refused to do CBS, which is interesting because he never really ran away from the press in 2016. And that was always his go to was that he could he could out talk any interviewer actually this time they had a very interesting rebuff to him not doing it it's been a tradition for more than half a century that the major party candidates for president sit down with 60 minutes in october this year vice president kamala harris and former president donald trump accepted our invitation but unfortunately last week Trump cancelled. But of course, it then became the subject of parody where Kamala Harris was appearing on another thing, which was Stephen Colbert's uh, late night show. And he ripped the piss out of 60 Minutes. Good evening. It has been a tradition here at The Late Show since yesterday that the major party candidates sit down with me for an interview in October. We invited Kamala Harris to be our guest this evening, and she accepted. In the interest of fairness, we also invited former President Donald Trump to go f himself. So meanwhile, Kamala sat down with Steve Colbert, Late Night Show, uh, Bill Whitaker to do CBS, Call Her Daddy, the podcast. So she's amassing these sort of massive studio audiences, clips that go viral. But actually, at the same time, in Pennsylvania... Donald Trump has returned to the scene of the attempted assassination on July the 13th. I remember that because it's my son's birthday. And he's gone back to Butler to stand now behind bulletproof glass and to take with him the man who is increasingly looking like his own deputy, actually, Elon Musk. And this is Elon Musk's first time on the campaign trail at Donald Trump's side. And he is like, he's jumping about. You can see his tummy. He's like the most excitable kid that's finally got recognised by the guy who could be the most powerful man in the world. Just have a listen to Musk talking us through what they're doing there. As you can see, I'm, I'm, I'm not just MAGA, I'm dark MAGA. Um, well, first of all, I, I want to say what an honour it is to, to be here. And... Uh, you know, the, the, the true test of someone's character is how they behave under fire. And we, we, we had one president who couldn't climb a flight of stairs and another who was fist pumping after getting shot. <laughs> fight, fight, fight. Blood coming down the face. So this is not for the girlies. <laughs> this is for the blokes, right? This is the two of them just oozing testosterone, talking about fighting, fist pumping and an attempted assassination. And also Dark Maga. And it's the kind of reference to Batman and the reference that you're going to come back stronger, tougher, mm. darker, meaner than you were before. Nice. And so this is going to be a second term. Dark Maga in, in those circles means... Trump unleashed, Trump unchained, Trump doing what he wanted to do eight years ago, but was prevented from doing. And it's spawning conspiracy theories on the left, which some people are calling blue anon, like blue for Democrats and, you know, like QAnon, QAnon. but blue anon. Yeah. And the argument is that what is Elon Musk up to here? He never really liked Donald Trump. Why is he suddenly getting behind Donald Trump? And the theory goes like this, that Donald Trump gets elected president. The vice president then is J.D. Vance. He invokes Article 25 of the Constitution that will declare Donald Trump unfit to hold office. He gets the cabinet to support it and Congress to back it. J.D. Vance becomes the president and suddenly the tech bro billionaires will be able to make even more money because 
J.D. Vance is a fully signed up, intelligent right wing libertarian and buys into all the theories that they do. Now, there is no evidence of this at all, but it's getting a lot of purchase. It's being talked about not quite in the same extent as QAnon was getting, uh, you know, conspiracy theories up and running. But don't think that conspiracy theories are solely the preserve of the right. They're taking hold on the left and a Republican grouping that is anti-Trump, the Lincoln Project, had their own advert, which is a version of it, where Trump is Caesar, J.D. Vance is Brutus. There's one big problem you never saw coming. Turn around. He's right behind you. It's J.D. His billionaire friends mock you. Why do you think they forced J.D. Vance on you? You think he won't stab you in the back to seize 10 years of power in the White House? So yes, Donald. They really are up to get you. And the one who will betray your presidency is right by your side. And I guess what is at the heart of this is it doesn't really matter if it's all conspiracy theory. It will fuel paranoia in Trump. And we know that there is one thing that Trump puts above everything else. It's actually been said quite often of Boris Johnson here in the UK, and that's loyalty. You know, a determination to only surround yourself with people who buy into your vision, buy into your way of doing things and frankly love you. And if I guess either the Blue Anons or, as you've said, the, the Republicans against Trump manage to sow seeds of doubt between Trump and his lieutenant, they've kind of done their job. Exactly. Because Trump will hate the idea that there's a story somehow going around that J.D. Vance is only there to pull him down and is not really a loyal deputy. And this is particularly poignant in a week where newer messages have been revealed by, we think, an employee at Deloitte, an accountancy firm, that show what Vance was saying about Trump. Not back in the sort of, you know, 2015, 2016 days when we know he called Trump America's Hitler and, and, you know, all the toxic stuff he was writing then. Much, much more recently, ahead of the 2020 election, where he said Trump has just so thoroughly failed to deliver on his economic populism, I think he'll probably lose. Now, all this stuff is being vastly circulated and shared on social media. All it takes is for Trump to start thinking, does this guy still hate me? Does he really think that? Have I got this wrong? For things to look very uncomfortable between the two of them now. Well, joining us now is Sarah Churchwell, author of The Wrath to Come, Gone with the Wind and the Lies America Tells. Um, and we should also say that you're professor, actually, of American uh, Lit at uh, the University of London here. But, Sarah, there's this wonderful line in your book, which I'm going to sort of give to our listeners because I think it places one of the conundrums that you discuss, which is that you say the United States is especially prone to cognitive dissonance because of the brutal realities of American life in conflict with what it promises. In other words, when it calls itself United States, it's like calling yourself a perfect couple. It can't possibly be true, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. And it's actually like calling yourself a perfect couple. It's protesting too much. It's yeah. actually going to make everybody wonder what on earth is going on behind the scenes going and on. are you about to get a divorce, you know? So, you know, we talk about the individual ways that people respond to cognitive, cognitive dissonance, but we don't often talk about it at the collective level. But I think in America, you can really see that, that we have, we, so we've developed all of these kinds of collective fantasies that enable us to navigate the fact that the facts on the ground simply do not align with the things that we declare about ourselves, our country, what we're like, what our history has been, all of that stuff. And the gap is getting wider and wider. How do you um, unite that sense of what America thinks it should be with where the candidates are right now? Because, I mean, in a way, you know, Trump is the more honest one mm. at this point. He's the one going, fuck that, right? <laughs> you know, I want power. I want to do this my way. I didn't really like what they did. You know, mm. I know he compares himself to Abraham Lincoln, but, yeah, well, you know, <laughs> deep breath. Or anybody else who pops into his head. <laughs> right. And I guess Kamala Harris, she is inheriting the sort of mantle of be, be the better America for the world, right? Well, she is, but I'm not sure. I don't think I would agree that Trump is the more honest one, not least because of the way that he spews lies every five seconds, but because there are two competing visions 
in my view, what the, the fight is really about is about, and I think this is about the UK as well, and it's maybe worth saying that I'm a dual citizen, so I vote in yeah. both elections, um, is that it's a, it's a battle between good faith politics and bad faith politics. It's a battle between, it is between idealism and cynicism. Trump embraces cynicism and, and he keeps trying to say, well, there are no higher ideals and there's no worth, there's no, you, there's no point in even fighting for it. And let's just dismantle everything and sell it to the highest bidder and that will all be fine. And we'll, it's dog eat dog and let's just get on with that, right? And whereas to say, actually, and you know, I would use Lincoln exactly there, right? That great um, image, angels. the better, better angels of our nature, right? So she is trying to, uh, to you know, connect to that, and and that's not about Americans being better than other people. It's about humanity. It's about saying all people have better angels of their nature and lesser angels, and saying, are we going to be our better selves or are we going to be our worst selves? And that, to me, is what those two candidates symbol. Yeah, but Sarah, isn't Donald? Doesn't Donald Trump have a point when he? taps into the discontent that so many Americans felt, particularly after 2008, the financial crash. They felt that the politicians at Washington were kind of not representing them, that it was a swamp. And Donald Trump was the change maker, the disruptor, the person who was there to change it all around. And yeah, to say we've got too many migrants, we've got to build a wall, we've got to keep Muslims out, we've got to do all these things if we want to make America great again. Right. So look, they they had real reasons for believing that they they were right that their standard of living was falling, um, that they were increasingly disconnected from the you know government policies. But the idea the idea that Donald Trump is the guy who's going to turn that around for the little man is just a delusion. I mean, it absolutely is, and we saw that over. I mean, he gave tax cuts to the rich. We know what he does. So the idea that people are telling themselves, well you know, Trump is the guy who's going to save me. I mean, I think Kamala has been very cogent about that stuff in her recent interviews, saying, you know, pointing out that he never talks about, you know, what he's going to do for you. He only talks about what he's going to do for himself. So sure, their grievances are real, but he encourages them to scapegoat. He encourages them to blame immigrants. He encourages them to to blame women. He encourages them in, in, in slightly more subtle ways to blame black people and black women, right? To say that, you know, he just did it with Kamala's recent uh, interview view on The View saying, you know, that the, she was surrounded by dumb women. So it's going to be the most gendered election, yeah. isn't it, we've ever seen in terms of the percentage <clears throat> of women voting for her, percentage of men voting for him. Yeah, I think that, well, we don't know for sure about the older women, but certainly among younger women, I think that the, the trends are unmistakable, right? There was a, a 150% surge in Latina young voters, 18 to 29, after she was nominated, 175% uh, increase in young black women of the same age suddenly rushed to register for the and first time. And where are time. young black men going? Well, they are increasingly seem to be shifting. We're seeing, you know, some movement back towards Trump there. But overwhelmingly, the black demographic is still voting for Kamala. And, and, and you know, uh, but I really think this is going to be a um, this is going to be an election that is decided by young people. One of the things to if they turn I mean, if they turn out or don't turn out. Right. That's going to be what. So that's what why it. just to take you back mm. right to our beginning. Thing, that's why she has to do call her daddy. Yeah. Because, I mean, five million listeners a week, we were saying, why is she talking, why is she preaching to the converted? Yeah. And you think it's because the converted might stay on their sofas. It, yeah, it's because of turnout and because <laughs> they aren't all, they aren't all converted, right? Alex Cooper, the host of, of Call Her Daddy, is, you know, from, she's from, a, an affluent small town in Pennsylvania. She has a small C conservative kind of background. And a lot of her listeners are like that. They may be broadly sympathetic toward Harris, but that doesn't mean they're going to get off their couch mm -hmm. and vote. Mm -hmm. So it's actually reaching those women and persuading them that Kamala speaks for them. I mean, is she reaching as many Republican voters? No, but I don't think she's necessarily trying to convert Republicans. I think that what she's trying to do is to convert undecideds who were in the double negatives, mm -hmm. who thought that both Biden and Trump were impossible. And so we're either not going to vote at all or might have tilted toward Trump. And to convince them, by, and that is, I think, why she has been shifting moderate since the nomination. She's trying to find that center ground. But for me, you know, one of the key statistics in this election that hasn't gotten enough attention is that, so people keep saying, you know, are we ready to vote for a woman, right? It's as simple as that. Yeah, yeah. Will America vote for a woman? But in 2016, we did, right? The popular vote went to Hillary. So even then, it was the she didn't win in those 10,000 votes in those three states. They didn't vote for Hillary. But America popularly was ready to vote for Hillary by an extra 5 million votes. Since in those eight years, 20 million baby boomers have died and 35 to 40 million young voters have come of electoral age. So it ought to be an absolute shoe. I mean, in terms if, of the popular vote. If they turn out, well, yeah. if they turn out and in the right places, exactly. Yeah. So do you so feel optimistic? States, or are you kind of... I mean, you know, we know how it's bedwetters. The bedwetters, exactly. Yeah, well, I was yeah. going to. You, you got there first, mate. Yeah. Um, look, I. 
everybody is uh, I don't think anybody has any confidence in an election that looks this close in the polls that we should be making predictions. And I, anybody who does, I think, you know, they're fooling themselves or they're trying to fool you. Um, it does look very close. The polls are not giving us any clear. We're in the margin of error in too many places. But I personally think that sense of of a movement that that Harris and Waltz got going with, uh, you know, around their nominate, you know, around the time of the nomination and with their rallies, that sense of energy, that rock star energy, that's that's bringing people to stadiums and long queues, and we're not seeing that. We're seeing Trump and JD Vance, the the energy around them deflates, and and it's it's a vibe, it's a feel. I can't make that, I can't quantify quantify that. But I just find it very difficult to believe that that's not going to translate into votes at all. I mean, we were talking to a pollster uh, last night who was saying that, yes, her likability ratings have gone up mm. and that hasn't quite followed in the poll ratings. But he was saying that there's the motivation to vote is now higher among Democrats than it is among Republicans. Whereas what we've seen in previous election cycles is obviously Trump supporters massively motivated to vote so you know that exactly. vibe thing exactly I, I right think. They, i think it's a turnout i think it's a turnout uh, election people are talking a lot about individual policies whether they're going to move the needle and i think it's about turnout and she has a 14 point enthusiasm gap among young voters so it's about driving the young vote into the poll and getting them registered which they've been very successfully doing and these are people who were not engaged in either elect you know, any election before or the 2024 election previously, and they are now signing up to to um, to vote. And so then it's about, you know, obviously it's about translating that into them actually well, getting what into What about the... Musk on the other side? I mean, yeah. isn't that bringing in lots of young men, lots of new first time voters? Is but he Potentially. Right. And so, yeah. So what we're seeing is, you know, that that gender split that you were just talking about, it's kind of battle of the sexes, certainly among young people. I think it probably is. And we're seeing that in the two campaigns that Trump is very much focused on the manosphere, right, yeah. on the right wing that the Andrew Tates and the Joe Rogans and getting those young men. And certainly Elon Musk is a kind of poster child for that. Right. So bring him along and hope that he will motivate, you know, young men to get out, keep keep again, scapegoating, you know, telling them that women and immigrants are the reason that they feel disaffected and, you know, pushing grievance politics. And then you have Kamala saying, OK, well, if you're going to talk to those young men, I'm going to talk to the young women who listen to Call Her Daddy. So, so just brilliant. <laughs> really interesting to have you in. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. Thank you. I'll tell you, Stephen, I mean, there's so much devastation already from Hurricane Helene. I'm, I met a woman in Georgia who just days before lost her husband because a tree fell on their house and killed him. What just upsets me so is the idea that any politician would play political games with these folks, with people who are in the midst of such suffering, loss of life, loss of their homes, loss of normalcy, and then for the sake of political gain, tell these lies in a way that is meant to make people distrust the help that is there for them to receive. We know about Kamala's name on the ballot in November and we know about Donald's name on the ballot in November but there are two others to consider. One is Helene and the other is Milton. There are two hurricanes, one which has descended and one which as we record is due about now to make landfall which could have a devastating impact on people's lives but they are deeply political in a way that maybe we haven't seen before, where misinformation and lies are spreading like wildfire about what the government is doing. And it looks as though the Trump campaign is trying to weaponize these as much as possible in the hope that it will drive people away from Kamala Harris in November. Hurricanes have a way of hitting swing states at this peculiarly sensitive time of year. And so Helene hit North Carolina, parts of Georgia, and Milton is now hitting Florida. I mean, virtually as we speak. And 20 million people in around the Tampa area, the Bay Area, have been put on what they call Hurricane Watch. And 5 million have been told right now to evacuate, to get out of there. You know, I think we heard from the city mayor saying, you will die if you do not get out. I'm telling you this now. And so you've got this very strange situation where Kamala Harris, as the vice president of the United States, of course, should be going to visit all of these places where, 
you know, storms have either hit or might be hitting or, you know, talking to the people and residents. But as soon as she turns up there, you have got Republican governors like Ron DeSantis in Florida saying, why are you politicising this? Why are you here? Why is the contender for the Democratic nomination, why is the contender for, for the presidency here on my patch? Trump has been putting out all sorts of spurious rubbish about FEMA, you know, the, the kind of environmental agency that, that offers support, not being able to be available to people on the ground. And she said, of course it is. Biden said, of course it is. Then she offers to go to Florida. And Ron DeSantis is saying, why are you politicising this by turning up here? You know, as if it's kind of disaster tourism. It's a far cry from, say, if you think back to Hurricane Sandy, which is when it hit the eastern seaboard of the United States and sort of New Jersey, Massachusetts. And I think we were both in we're the in States York, at the time. Yeah. I, I was there because the, we were both there for the presidential election uh, in 2012. And the governor of New Jersey at the time, Republican, was Chris Christie. He embraces the help that is being offered yeah. by the federal government in the shape of Barack Obama. It's worth kind of listening to just the difference in tone where you've got Ron DeSantis in Florida saying, get lost, I don't want you anywhere near my state. And Chris Christie then saying, thank you. We had a president arriving in New Jersey and there's an infamous picture that you paid a political price for, some would argue, of you and Barack Obama. Yep. Tell us about Barack Obama arriving in New Jersey and dealing with the people of New Jersey. Well, let's remember the context, too, which you, which you implied in your question, which is that we were eight days away from a national election when Hurricane Sandy hit. And, and I was, if not the top surrogate for Mitt Romney, at least one of the top surrogates. And so when the storm hit, the day after, um, the president called me and he said, I want to come to New Jersey, but if that's going to be awkward for you, we should talk about it. And I said, Mr. President, you're the president of the United States. We want you to come to New Jersey. I mean, this is Chris Christie, obviously, remembering, I guess, what you would call happier times when Republicans and Democrats did speak to each other. I wonder if it was like that at the time. I mean, right now you have got the Virginia governor, Glenn Youngkin, who is saying, thank you, Biden. Yeah, we do actually need this. I think you've also got the Georgia governor, uh, Brian Kemp, who has said, actually, they are there, you know, that, that stop spreading misinformation. He famously doesn't get on at all well with Trump. So I think the misinformation is not coming from Republicans and it's certainly not coming from the states themselves. The, the disinformation is coming right from the top from Trump and Vance, you know, and there is one clip where Trump actually calls her out for not being in the state that she is in. Have a listen. We're offering people $750. For immediate needs. For the worst, yeah, yeah but for the worst hurricane that anybody's seen. Uh, but she shouldn't be there anyway. She should be, I would say, that North Carolina is, bad, is so bad. And she she was there be, today for three hours, I believe, uh, Kamala Harris. Look, it's fair enough for things to get political if the federal government makes a mess of the rescue effort, as it did after Hurricane Katrina. Katrina. Exactly. This all goes back to Katrina in one shape or form. Not that it is like that, but that Donald Trump is trying to reenact that. Yes. And, um, 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 you know, George W. Bush took a hell of a lot of flack for his response. And subtle, but in even many ways more profoundly devastating is the lasting damage to the survivors' will to rebuild and remain in the area. The destruction of the spirit of the people of southern Louisiana and Mississippi may end up being the most tragic loss of all. George Bush doesn't care about black people. Best cartoon uh, that I saw over the government response was there was a guy in a boat and there's another guy up to his chest in water and it's Roe versus Wade, R-O-W, yeah. Roe versus Wade, as yeah. that was the only choice that um, the American people had. And it was unbelievable in New Orleans, because I, I, I flew to Mobile, Alabama, where we were only allowed at the car hire place to have half a tank of fuel, because the whole of that Gulf Coast was out of petrol, to then drive to Biloxi, to Gulfport, to Baton Rouge, and then into New Orleans. And you thought, wow, they are so dependent as a first world country on having fuel, it drove water. Mm. There was no water in the taps. We mm. couldn't stay. All the hotels had shut because they didn't have any running water. And, you know, it's going to be a bit like that in Tampa. So you can see why it has such a political effect so quickly. Um, 
And Donald Trump isn't waiting to see whether the government responds well or badly. He wants to get his revenge in first. And Kamala Harris tearing up her hair out and saying, you've got to be careful about what you believe yeah. when you hear the conspiracy so theories. So she's literally going on these shows to actually remind people not to believe some of the stuff that they're hearing. One of the men who brought us Watergate, Bob Woodward, who obviously worked on that with Carl Bernstein, has just published a book. He is a prolific writer. And his latest book goes inside the Trump post-presidency. He's chronicled conversations with Trump right the way through his tenure. And his latest book called War is about to hit the stands. And it has the revelation that Trump has had what he's calling up to seven calls with Vladimir Putin since he stopped being president. In other words, as a normal citizen, an ex-president, he has still been talking to Putin. But isn't there something else in this book as well, which again, again, it relates to Putin, is that he sent him COVID tests. So Donald Trump, when he was president, is sending the Russian president COVID tests so that he can test himself. Not for the Russian people, not, not for, the, for the good people. of the country, but just for, for but Putin himself. But and Putin's had to say, oh, I think you might want to keep that quiet because people won't really look very favourably on that if they know. I mean, he's actually telling that to Trump. And you can just imagine, imagine you're Volodymyr Zelensky in Ukraine and thinking, I wonder what the post-election settlement looks like if Donald Trump becomes the president. He is not even in his views on Ukraine and Russia. It is absolutely clear he is with Vladimir Putin. Yeah, the interesting thing is, and, and Woodward, the, the book will come out next week, Woodward is basically suggesting that this kind of conversation, this communication that Trump's had um, with Putin, who is, let's not forget, you know, currently invading another country, um, is a greater scandal than the Watergate affair. And the trouble is, of course, that even the Watergate affair would not really have touched the sides of Trump if Trump had been the Nixon in that case. And so you understand the timing of this. You know, Woodward's thinking, oh, this will this will shift the dial. This will make people sit up. Nobody will want to vote for Trump if they think he's been in bed with Putin. I think it's all counted in. Oh, it? yeah, it's baked into the share it's price. It's baked in. There is nothing you can hear about Trump now. I, I'm trying to think if there is anything that we could be told about Trump now that would shift the dial for his supporters. That he sent tests to Joe Biden and that had done something gracious across the aisle. <laughs> that might just upset it. Yeah. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. The News Agents USA.